Let me show you my three data pins that I always look at for any diagnosis. Using my X tool, XT70W, we're gonna go ahead and enter this particular 2014 Scion to do some data pit analysis. Why would you want to take out your big guns such as your Pico scope and all that fun stuff when all you have is a skewed input sensor that you can find using a scan tool? And know me, you know that I'm a scope junkie. Whenever I can use a scope, I'm going to do it. However, if I can see, save myself a lot of time using my scan tool, I'm definitely gonna do that. So with today's videos, I'm gonna show you guys a couple of the data pits that I personally use during a diagnosis or an evaluation, particularly if the vehicle has no diagnostic trouble codes. And I hope this information will help you guys when you're stuck with one of those cars you might not have codes with or you don't have an idea of where to head with your particular evaluation. If you guys are ready, grab your scan tools. Let's take a look. Looking at my X tool, I could see that here we have our global OBD2 side. Of automotive engineers helped us put out global and manufacturer specific when it comes to diagnostic equipment and diagnostic information coming from the vehicle. Here would be my manufacturer specific for this particular Scion that I'm actually checking out. If you use your scan tool to pull the VIN number out of mode 9 PID 2, you're automatically going into the manufacturer specific side. Here on the manufacturer specific side, yes, you might see a lot of different data PIDs. However, the manufacturer has the ability to substitute values. If you're looking at a sensor value that looks really good, but you have a code for it, you're actually seeing the computer put in a known good value. So this way the car can continue to run. Go into the generic side of OBD2. Most scan tools are either gonna do an auto scan or you can select which protocol the vehicle might be communicating with. In most cases, the vehicle is 2008 and newer. It's gonna be ISO 15765-4 or controller area network can communication protocol. So we're gonna tap that one. Once we do that, now the scan tool has communicated to the vehicle and now we have access to all 10 modes of OBD2. See, most technicians actually know the 10 modes of OBD2, you just don't know them by name. You just know them by whatever the scan tool tells you. So when you guys uh, pull codes, freeze frame, or confirm DTCs, that would be mode three, mode seven, and mode zero A. Anytime you guys clear codes, that would be mode zero four. If you're looking at live data, that'd be mode one. Freeze frame would be mode two. And then if you're looking at vehicle information, such as VIN number, Cal ID, CVN, that would be in mode nine. If you're trying to do bi-directional, that would be mode eight. Mode six is a great useful tool to see non-continuous tests for non-continuous systems. If the vehicle is not can, you'll have mode five. Right, and then we can also see readiness status in mode one. We're gonna go into live data, so we're gonna go here right into mode one. What the scan tool is doing right now is it's curing the car to ask the car, what data should I expect to see? Now that we're in the data, now we can actually begin to scroll through it and watch sensor information from this particular Scion. When it comes to any drivability diagnostic, I don't care if it's a DTC related or no DTCs present, the first thing you should always look at is your loop status. Is this vehicle in closed loop? What closed loop is letting you know is that the vehicle's O2 sensors are now reporting data back to the computer and the computer is making fuel trim adjustments, including ignition adjustments based off of sensor inputs and it's not running off of pre-programmed information from the manufacturer. Most vehicles do have different modes of fuel system status. Back in the day, it was just OL for open loop and CL for closed loop. But now with vehicles admins, we can actually have OL fault and OL drive. So let's take a look-see. This particular vehicle, if I do a wide open throttle acceleration, keep an eye on my loop status. What ended up happening there is because I went wide open throttle, the PCM goes into open loop drive. What that is, is the PCM now is ignoring all sensor inputs and it's going wide open injector pulse and giving it as much fuel as it possibly can. The insight that this is giving you is it's letting you know if you have really good fuel delivery. Does the fuel pump have the juice to give this engine the fuel it needs under high throttle command? That is the reason why it's a good idea to always run a throttle or wide open throttle acceleration 
on any vehicle you're diagnosing and monitor the loop status. If the loop status does not go into open loop drive, there's a high probability you have an input problem. So now your job is to determine which input is the one the PCM is not seeing properly and making those fuel adjustments. That could be your throttle position sensor, your mass airflow sensor, your MAP sensor, or an oxygen sensor or air fuel ratio sensor. You do go wide open throttle and it goes into open loop drive, but the car's still bogging out. That means that you're not getting enough juice out of the fuel pump due to a bad fuel pump or restricted fuel filter. And now you're gonna go check that to then determine what your next step would be to repair that particular vehicle. The data pit you would wanna look at would be engine coolant temperature. Now, when you're starting the car up from cold, key on engine off, your engine coolant temp and your intake air temp should be roughly about 10% or 10 degrees from one another. If you're in an emission state and you might have a vehicle that's being really difficult for you to actually set a particular readiness flag or readiness monitor, depending on how you've been taught, it could be you have a time to temperature issue. You wanna see the temperature rise about one degree every half a second. And if you see that your temperature is taking way too long to reach its normal operating temp, that's usually indicative of either a bad sensor or a faulty thermostat. We got to work on a Volkswagen that came into the shop because the vehicle had a rich running code. The shop that worked on it prior to us actually replaced the fuel injectors thinking the injectors were leaking, causing the excessive fuel consumption. When we did the time to temperature test on the ECT, it took roughly 10 minutes for the vehicle to fully warm up. The teardown time from the customer to pull the thermostat out. And when we did, we found the thermostat was slightly stuck open and that was causing the vehicle to take that long to warm up. So we recommended replacing the thermostat. Once we put the thermostat on, the vehicle reached normal operating temperature in about a minute and a half. So again, this is why it's important to monitor the ECT, particularly when the vehicle has been cold or sitting for a while to make sure that the ECT is climbing at the right rate. The pit that I always take a look at is relative throttle position, or in some vehicles would be throttle position in voltage. The reason why I take a look at this is this is gonna let me know is the computer seeing any throttle actuation when I'm not actually pressing on the pedal. If the vehicle has a voltage reading here, typically you wanna see about half a volt or 500 millivolts up to about 9 tenths of a volt or 900 millivolts at idle. That would be relatively normal. Here we can see that this vehicle is at idle and we're getting a zero reading. Now if I begin to apply the throttle, notice how the value begins to change. So the reason why we wanna look at the throttle position is this input is very, very important for the PCM to make a lot of fine tune adjustments. For example, the throttle position sensor helps us with our load and speed cells. So if for some reason my throttle position is off compared to our mass airflow, the load and speed chart is not gonna match. So then the PCM is gonna try to make adjustments based off of faulty sensor inputs, which is gonna lead to a drivability concern. So this is why I always go and look at the throttle position sensor itself to make sure that I'm within correct throttle. Another thing that I always do is I do a wide open throttle acceleration just to make sure that we got a nice open ramp and we don't have any glitches or slight dropouts. Now, one of the downsides to using a scan tool is the information is transmitted via a wireless dongle to the scan tool. Tablet then has to translate it and then give me a graph. So in some cases, you might not be able to catch a glitch or a dropout as good as you would using an actual scope. But this is a really good starting point for you to determine, is this something I need to look at to then continue analyzing it a bit further down the road? What I'm saying here is these are the data pits that I always analyze with any diagnosis or evaluation that I'm doing with any particular problem. Why? Because if any one of those sensor or data pits are out of spec, that's gonna cause the vehicle to run in a default mode. So you're never gonna be able to find the problem if your inputs are not correct. As I was taught by my mentor, and I've heard this from many other mentors, including my buddy, Brandon Steckler, garbage in equals garbage out. If you got a bad input, how do you expect a good output command? You're not going to. 
This is why you want to start with data pit analysis before you start an evaluation, before you pull out a lab scope, before you go in cylinder, before you do delta sensor analysis, use your data from your scan tool for you to be able to determine where you're going to be headed with your particular diag. Found this information useful, do us a favor, give us a like and a follow and drop it in the comments and let me know what other information you would like to know about using a scan tool, including data pit and data pit analysis. If you didn't like it, also do me a favor, put it in the comments, let me know what you didn't like. This way I can do my best to try to correct that and hopefully in the next video, you might like it and it might help you. Guys, at Master Automotive Training, we're bettering the automotive industry one technician at a time. This starts with you. I really appreciate you guys being on here today. If I can be of any further assistance, drop it in the comments, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Oh,